There we go. Okay. So, um, I wanted to mention just a couple things before we get started. So the first thing is homework three due today. Um, feel free to, I'll, I'll, be, I'll be up tonight. So feel free to post on Piazza um, any questions that you have. I don't know, I don't remember when I said I'd close regrade requests for the, the homework two and the exam, but they're open until Friday. Um, because I'm not gonna get to them until the weekend. And then worksheet 10 and possibly 11 will be due on Friday as well, okay? Any questions before we get started on the content? Uh, I, I would prefer going through Gradescope. I did see your email though, I'll respond to it over the weekend. Yes. Uh, so the question is for question one are uh, I'm are you fine with the format that I put on Piazza? Yes. So just kind of showing, you know, through time, this branch is going to happen and it's going to be taken and then this other branch is going to happen it's going to be taken or not taken and just kind of showing the progression of which branches are being evaluated and which direction they go through time that's totally fine um that was uh the format that i'm looking for in the in the homework yes can we make assumptions about uh what the branch predictor will start like what state it was starting can can you assume a state that the branch predictor will start in? Let me think about the question. Uh, I think so. I, I think it should be fine because um, let me let me just look at it one once again. Homework, homework three. It'd be better if you didn't, but I'm not going to deduct touch points if you do assume uh, an initial state. Because so ideally, you'll be able to think of a a pattern for two different branches that will like 100% uh, always give you bad, uh, negative interference or positive interference. Um, oh, and by the way, you can choose which kind of branch predictor, whether it's a you know one bit or two bit or whatever, that's totally an option as well that will probably make some of these easier. So yeah, between, the, at least between, let me, did I mention? Uh, yeah. And yeah, like I'm not looking for code because that would be too hard. You can't even really say which, branches would be aliased anyway, because it is all dependent on the on the um, uh, like instruction address of, of the branch instruction. So, and that's like totally um, arbitrary. And also it's dependent on the size of the branch predictor, et cetera. When will P3 code, base code be available? Also this weekend, I have a lot of stuff to do guys. Um, it's pretty close, but my, my goal is to have that and homework for you next Monday. So, and no, I don't know what sleep is. Yes. To, to you, not do that'd be, that'd be really mean. Okay. Yeah. Other, any other questions? Cool. So um, uh, 
we finished up uh, out of order execution last time. There's a bit more um, regarding this data flow model. I'll, I'll touch like for two seconds on this. We're not going to cover it in depth, but the basic idea is that it's a different type of um, computer uh, system model. What like all modern computers are is this von Neumann model, which has this idea of control flow. It's it's what you're used to, but a data flow model is kind of more, I would say, along the declarative or functional lines um, where we can define a data flow in our instruction set architecture. And then that is what we, uh, and then we implement the, the necessary operations and hardware to you know, keep track of which operations can be performed at what time. So this is another uh, idea um, that can avoid having to do this out of order stuff. We can kind of have a, a queue of things that, that are available for us to do. Um, and that's just part of the ISA, not as an abstraction to kind of make the ISA look faster. All right, like I said, I'm not gonna cover much on this. If you're interested, you can read these slides. Um, but we're gonna hop into memory today. So where is memory? Well, it, it's between the processor and our storage. It's going to, well, it's critical to all computing systems. Everyone has memory, you know, even down to embedded processors, they have some bit of memory. Um, we, we need it in servers, we need it in mobile, we need it everywhere. And we also need it to scale. Um, there's lots of demand for data these days. Um, so we need it to be bigger. We need it to be faster. So we need our technology to be better. We need it to not burn the house down when we turn it on. So we need it to be efficient. We need it to be, you know, uh, cost efficient in the world. And we also, and we're gonna focus a lot on this today, or maybe not today, depending on how far we get, uh, on management algorithms. There's a lot of need to be able to manage our memory in a way that takes advantage of the hardware. So here's a just a view of kind of uh, a conceptual view of memory. Say we have a bunch of cores, in this case nine, they have their shared, uh, they have their L1 caches and they have L2 caches and then the L3 caches and then we have a memory controller um, that goes out to our shared memory. So this is what you can kind of think of. This is another layer outside of our processor. We're going across some bus over to shared memory um, and then that is all controlled by this memory controller. And then, uh, you know, outside of that is storage. So we have to pull our program data from a hard drive into memory, and then we can start dealing with it. Uh, and then if, you, if you've taken OS, you also know you have to page out to disk sometimes as well if you run out of physical memory. Modern applications, like I said, need more memory. I mean, these days, it isn't even like high performance applications that need memory. Like Electron needs a lot of memory. Google Chrome can basically eat memory for lunch. So, you know, e even if it's not a, um, a, you know, a high performance system, you still need a bunch of memory these days. Um, and you, the more and more we get like virtual machines and such, we're also going to need. Uh, that increased memory as well. One of the things that we'll talk about is this many core CPU situation where we have multiple threads um, performing parallel accesses to memory. This is gonna be a, another challenge we're gonna have to face because um, 
we could have a situation where one program gets uh, oh, like beats out other programs on memory axes and makes them slow, um, even if even if their priority is technically uh, higher. So we'll look at that a little bit later as well. Now, something unfortunate is happening, um, and that's that um, generally our, our core count is, is going up pretty fast. You know, my, our, you know, your Ryzen systems these days have like 36, 64 cores, and that's just a consumer grade system these days. What makes Google, Google Chrome different? That was mainly sarcastic, but browsers in general are, are very uh, memory intensive these days, um, mainly because well, a big part of it is because there's more bandwidth available. So programmers are taking advantage of that and just shoving you 10 megabytes of JavaScript because, you know, why not? Anyway, um, so yeah, the unfortunate thing is although cores are going up pretty quickly and general compute power alongside, uh, our, our capacity on DRAM isn't increasing as rapidly. So this is going to continue to be a problem as well. OK. So let's talk about some major trends that are affecting main memory. The first is need for capacity bandwidth um, and, and, and quality of service. So as I mentioned before, multi-core is a huge thing. As we get more cores, we can be having multiple data streams. You could have 64 different requests for memory at the same time. And obviously, as we get more cloud computing, all these sorts of things, um, uh, and data intensive applications, say like machine learning, we need more memory. Um, and we need no more bandwidth to be able to move that data from our main memory into our processor to actually do real work. Same with GPUs, we need more bandwidth to get data from our main memory into our GPU. Another thing, thing that is affecting memory these days is power and energy. Um, a lot of times this is where a big drain on, on uh, the system goes. There's a lot of energy spent in off-chip memory um, and one unfortunate thing that we'll look at for DRAM specifically is that it consumes power even when no memory accesses are happening. So unlike an SSD, which you can just turn it off and it'll be fine and store the data for a long time, a very, very long time, DRAM is not like that. It still needs constant power to um, uh, basically, we have to refresh each row um, in our in our memory periodically just to keep the data there. So that's going to consume power even when it's not being utilized. And it's a bit difficult to scale these days. It's doable, but it's it's still hard. We we can't um, we're running into problems when we scale below some some uh, small nanometer scales. Um, obviously, scale, the, the idea of scaling is we just pack more um, uh, transistors and such into smaller spaces and capacitors. Everything that we need to store data, we just compress it smaller. Um, we get more density. We can then also just store more. So let's, let's take a look briefly at this, this scaling problem. Um, so DRAM's a, a charge-based memory. We store data as charges in a capacitor. And so th this requires a few things. First of all, it requires that they have, the capacitor has to be large enough to be able to sense it reliably. Um, the, we, we need to have 
a transistor that is large enough that we don't leak too much of, uh, of, the, of the energy. And we also retain the energy for high, a long enough time that we can, you know, um, uh, that our data doesn't go away. So, and, and scaling beyond a certain scale, um, 40 or 35 nanometers ish, is pretty challenging. And I, I would like to present to you just a bit of evidence for, for why that is. Um, we're going to see this a little bit later, but RAM is uh, organized in rows. So we'll, we'll discuss this further, but just kind of think of these as being physical rows of, uh, of, of memory lines that are storing data. And when we want to read data from a row, we have to open it by putting voltage across this line and doing electrical engineering stuff. I don't really know. It's not super important. And when we, then we close it when we are done reading it and we lower the voltage. Now, an unfortunate thing happens when you pack things together and that's that you get interference. So, if you have, uh, if you put voltage across this row, um, it could potentially cause disturbance in uh, adjacent rows. If, you, if you're packed in too tightly and don't have the necessary, um, uh, if the necessary shielding isn't in place or isn't as, as robust as you would like. So this is gonna be a big problem, right? If you're able to just put voltage across this row and, and affect other rows, that's going to be very bad. Um, and this is an actual actual thing. It's called row hammer. You can, you're going to read this paper as participation homework. Um, but the idea is that you can have this aggressor row, which is uh, uh, has this voltage going across. It's being read a bunch of times over and over and over and over again which causes the lines that are close to it to potentially have bit split, which is not good, right? That, that at the very best causes data corruption. At the worst, you know, maybe you get lucky and you flip a bit that is like your uh, security privilege uh, bit, which would be even worse. Okay, so the idea is that we will try and induce this, and uh, you'll read more details on, on how this works in this paper. Um, but the idea is that you'll induce this by uh, opening and closing this row a bunch of times, just like over and over and over and over again. And then you just hope that the adjacent rows have some disturbance errors. And this exists in a lot of DRM chips that are on the market. It's not so great um, as of as of this paper. Pretty much, as you can see, like 80, 80 ish percent, eighty to ninety percent of all uh, chips coming out of uh, these three unnamed um, companies all have errors and are vulnerable to this attack. I'll, I'll show you briefly, kind of how you might go about doing this. And then um, I'll, I'll let you read and read the paper as well. So if we just loop this for forever, okay, so this is, we're just doing a infinite loop where we're um, reading uh, from X, this is just some generic memory location. And then we read from y and we we do that uh, and then we flush each one of these um and then so this will basically write it back to our uh, ca cause us to have to actually um open the line and, and read it and then uh we fence this which will kind of reset everything now we're accessing 
going back and forth between these two lines, accessing them over and over, causing memory errors. So, so the, the, uh, we'll see this in a minute, but if we just tried to access a single line, if we just tried to access X over and over and over again, there's actually another secondary buffer that will kind of save, save us in that case. Um, so by alternating between these two different lines, these different rows like this, we're, we're able to avoid this, this uh, um, real buffer that we're going to see in just a moment um, and induce this, this error. There are ways around this. One of the main ways is just to, um, at a hardware level, if we see that a row is being hammered a bunch, we just move the row somewhere else. And then, you know, th this, this needs to be some large number of, of iterations for any errors to occur. So let's just like after a thousand, you know, uh, move the row somewhere else and it'll be fine. Do the two rows need to be physically close together in memory? So that's where it becomes a little bit interesting because uh, it's not really easy to determine where exactly in your RAM any given memory address will be. That's a pretty difficult thing just because there's so many layers of abstraction between a memory address and an actual physical like capacitor in your DRAM. Um, so the idea mainly is just to kind of have two that are fairly far apart that hopefully aren't in the same uh, uh, same one close together. Okay. So that's just a brief uh, foray into seeing that, you know, scaling's an issue. We're gonna, uh, there's, there's lots of problems that are um, pretty interesting to solve in this area. And I, I think that there's some movement towards trying to look at new technologies other than DRAM for memory. Um, I'm not sure how, how, uh, how far they've gotten on those. Okay, so I'm kind of realizing that we don't have enough worksheets for the rest of the semester to fill up the, you know, 80 or whatever points that I want um, for participation on the worksheet. So I'm going to add a lot of points here. So this is probably something that you want to do. It's going to be pretty easy. You read the paper and then type up 250 words about it um, and submit it on Gradescope. And I'll, I'll put up the submission probably this weekend. I'll give you a, a, a week or so, probably till next, not this Friday, but next Friday. So, um, oh, it, it's it, in this paper, um, is available on the website down here as a PDF. Um, you can also, if you, you know, have access to the ACM archive, you can, you know, download it from here, but I don't. And I, uh, Dr. Wu sent me the PDF whenever I took it last, whenever I took this class. So here it is. So I would just use that. Okay. So let's look and see again, just how this a, a bit, uh, let, let's go zoom out again and look at um, this on an actual chip. So we have our um, chip with a bunch of cores. We have, you know, cache somewhere in, in here. Then we have a bunch of L2, L2, L3 way over here. That's pretty big because it's the last line of defense. And then we have this DRAM interface. And you notice there's a lot of space allocated to this because it's actually a very complicated bit of hardware. It's not just um, 
uh, and, oh, and also we have our DRAM controller in here as well that, that, that is going out to this interface. There's a lot of stuff that's going to have to go on in this uh, in these two um, bits of the processor because we need to communicate out across our motherboard to a, a different chip. This is just out, uh, entirely separate from our processor. Now, there are some processors that are starting to become more popular that have the RAM integrated in with the CPU. Um, a lot of mobile processors do this. The M1 does this. Um, and I have a feeling we might see some trends towards doing that more. Um, just because the other, the other thing that you can do is you can also put your GPU on your same die and, and you know, then your memory accesses on the GPU are fast as well. So there's a lot of advantages to that, but um, especially in like server loads, we're going to see still these off chip memory banks being uh, predominant for a while I, I, is, my, is my best guess. I showed this to you last time, but um, you can see here, this is my computer and my CPU is under, under this thing. As we've talked about, there's lots of heating problems. Right? We have to cool it with this you know, massive heat sink. And then over here, uh, off the chip are our memory modules. We're gonna see in just a moment that uh, they're organized in a very specific manner, but uh, these two general generally they're 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 in pairs. This is one memory channel, and this is another memory channel. So um, there's some parallelism on the channels, which helps increase performance. And also, if you ever build your own computer, make sure and you only have two RAM slots, for example, you want to put one in one channel. And the other in the other channel, and leave leave gaps, because that's it. Actually, matters. It'll it'll change the performance of your system quite significantly. Um, so that is a, a bit of a, a view of this main memory on a real system. Oh, and by the way, I think these are these have a bit of like. Uh, they look cool, right? But it's also a heat sink, this, this black thing sheath on top. So that the more, more and more we're seeing that, you know, because, because of the energy requirements, you're needing a little bit of cooling on your RAM chip these days. Okay, a couple of terms before we get into talking about our sub, uh, DRAM sub, subsystem hierarchy. The first is physical address space. Okay, so this is the maximum size of main memory. So this is the total number of uniquely identifiable locations. So if we have eight gigabytes, um, then, then that's going to be our, our physical address space, this eight gigabytes worth of space. The next thing is this, the next concept is physical addressability. And this is the minimum size of data in memory that can be accessed. I'll relate this to what we've already seen in caches where um, we can, we pull in an entire cache line whenever we access even just one part of it. Um, and so that the cache lines are kind of our blocks uh, and that's kind of the minimum size of data that that matters at that um, uh, um, at that cache level. The same thing applies for RAM. We're have, going to have a minimum size of data in the memory that we can access. So some examples we could be byte addressable. Maybe we're word addressable. We'll fix that. Maybe we're 64-bit addressable. It really just depends on your microarchitectural uh, accessibility, um, or like it depends on your implementation. 
what which which implementation and you know what th there's a lot of factors that go into this um but these are two terms that we're going to just have to keep in the back of our mind to be able to make sense of, of the rest of this okay any questions before we dive in and look at our DRAM subsystem? So how we're gonna go is we're gonna do a bottom-up view. So we're gonna start at the very base level of this, the DRAM subsystem, and then we're going to go to the top. And then we will, a little bit quicker, take a look from the top down. And each direction, it'll hopefully, between both directions, you'll hopefully get a good understanding of that hierarchy and how it works. Physical address spaces, total number of unique locations. Does that mean after dividing by addressability? Um, let me get back to you on that. Where's my notes? I think generally people talk about it as raw memory space, but great question. Uh, I will try and find an answer for you. Okay. So bottom up view. This is on your worksheet. Mainly, I want you to write it down on the worksheet so you'll have something else to reference as we're going through this so you can kind of orient yourself as I'm talking about these various different components. At the very bottom of our subsystem are our rows and columns. So we've kind of already alluded to that when I showed you the stuff with the row hammer. Um, but they're organized in this row and column uh, idea. The next level up is a bank, which is a bunch of rows and columns. A chip is a bunch of banks. A rank is a bunch of chips. A module, normally these modules are uh, DIM modules, which stands for dual inline memory module. A DIM is one or more ranks. And then a channel is one or more modules. Are the cores in the row and column? No. So so the 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 capacitors are going to be so this is out in, in, in memory. So our th this would be kind of a cell in our row column matrix. Okay, so Let's look at a bank, because a bank is just kind of the, the, the classification, kind of the lower classification. The bank contains uh, both columns and rows. Um, so it's basically a grid. And the, the basic idea is that we get our address. We have to decode it. And the decoding just involves splitting it up into our um, row index and then our column index. Our row is determined by the most significant bits. We spend the least significant bits down to the column decoder to tell us which columns to pull out of. So what happens is that we use our row decoder to figure out which row 
we're going to read from. So we read the entire row. We can't read less than an entire row. We have to read all of it. And to do that, we have to you know, do this amplification of the row data. And then at the end, we have to decode the column. So that's where these least significant bits come in. And that selects a subset of the row and sends it off on the bus to the, the, the pins and, and over to our CPU. Okay, so again, we're reading the entire row and then selecting a subset of it using our column decoder. After that, we pre-charge the bit lines for the next access. Okay. Um, let me. Where's our? Oh, okay. It's it's, it's on in just a minute. So, one of the key ideas in 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 memory is that we want to try and um, make everything look fast right uh, i guess that's a goal of all of computer architecture and one way that we can do that is by parallelizing accesses um, if we have a single monolithic memory array that's not going to be parallelizable we can't access um, you know if we just had a, a massive 10,000 by 10,000, for example, or something crazy array, array like that, um, we wouldn't be able to have multiple accesses in parallel because we're, we're only able to read, it, read one row at a time. And the goal, obviously, is to reduce our latency by uh, enabling accesses in parallel. So what we're going to do is we're going to divide our, our memory into multiple banks, each of which can be accessed individually on the same cycle or in consecutive cycles interleaved together. Each bank is clearly going to be smaller than the entire memory storage then, right? It's only going to hold a subset of our memory space. And this goes to Ethan's question of like, where, how do we know if they're close together? Well, it's kind of difficult. Um, we aren't, we're going to have, obviously have to keep track of where the data is, but as a programmer, there's a lot of layers of abstraction between you and where the actual data is being stored in memory. Okay. So let's talk about this bank, this 2D array of cells that are, that are rows and columns. Uh, just one note on terminology, a DRAM row is also sometimes referred to as a DRAM page. And when we activate a row, we put it into this thing called a row buffer. We'll see that in just a moment. How that, uh, how that integrates in with all of this. And as you saw in the previous diagram here, we split up our address into our row and column bits. And so it's basically a, a pair of row and column. And when we access a row that is closed, so it's, it's, it's not currently in the, the, the row buffer, we have to activate it, we have to open it and put it into our row buffer. Then we can do the read write command um, on the row buffer itself. And then we, pre we can pre charge the, um, when we want to send that row back from the row buffer back into the, into the bank. If we access an open row, we can actually we we can avoid this activation because we will have it in our row buffer potentially 
So we'll, we'll see that there's there's two different strategies. Obviously, we can either keep it in the row buffer or send it back into our bank after every access, and both have trade-offs, obviously, because that's this entire class, basically. OK, so I'm going to switch quickly to the actual, um, where is it? Oh. The actual slides here, because there's fancy animations, and I'm going to use them in just a moment. Okay, I don't care. Oh dear. Okay, so here's our bank. We have a bunch of columns, we have a bunch of rows, and we have a row buffer. So this is a um, thing that we have talked about in the previous slide. It starts out empty. There's nothing in the row buffer. Um, but then we have an address uh, access. We're accessing, let's just say, row zero, column zero. So the row, the row address comes in to the row decoder, and it tells us, oh, we need to access this row. So we, crap. I thought there was an, better animations. Oh, well. We'll go with this for now. Oh dear. Sorry guys. This is why I just use PDFs. It's way easier than this. Darn it. There we go. So we move our row zero down into our row buffer. And then we access, we figure out which which column we need to access using our column address. It's this one. So we go ahead and send that out our data bus. Boom. Oh, there's our animation. Did you see that? Let me just, oh, so fancy. <laughs> All right. So that's how we get the data for this ad uh, address. So now we are done with that. Let's go on to our next access. This one's for row zero, column one. We come in and you know, we, we notice that we have row zero already in our row buffer. So it's a row buffer hit. Hopefully you've kind of noticed this is kind of a bit of a cache. So we're gonna have to deal with stuff that we've already seen with caching where we get hits and misses. If it's a hit, we use our column address and then we find which element um, in a row um, is being accessed and we send that across our bus. Now, if these are writes, it's kind of the same thing except for the data is going the opposite direction. We're moving the data up through, you know, through the bus from the CPU into our row buffer. So it's a slight distinction, but the idea is the same. Then we have another access. This one's for column 85 of the same row. So we get another hit. And we're accessing this one over here. Definitely not the scale. So uh, we'll, we'll just go with it anyway. Now, what happens if we have a row that is not in our row buffer? Well, we get a miss. We get a conflict. When we have a conflict, we have to get rid of row zero, and we can't just throw it away. We have to actually write it back up here. We have to put it back in, into the bank. Then we can use the row decoder to find the correct row, in this case, row one. Move that down. Um, and then use our column address like we did before, find the data, move it in, and get our, uh, get our memory um, location. 
Okay, any questions on this before we move on to the next level? Okay, so we've talked about our columns and rows. Those are pretty easy um, since it's just a grid. And then those are organized into a bank. The next level up is a chip. Chips contain multiple banks, normally two to 16. And all of the banks are going to share uh, command, address, and data buses. So they're all interconnected, but the idea, the idea of the chip is that we're kind of pulling together all of the uh, memory locations from the various banks and coalescing them together so we have a wider uh, amount of memory that we're sending across our bus. Um, yeah, so we're, we're trying to take as much advantage as, as we can uh, of this narrow interface that we, that we have. And so that's why we need multiple banks. Let's switch back over here. So those are chips. The next level up is a collection of chips, as you might imagine. And this is a, a DRAM rank. And each rank is going to have a bunch of chips that are operated together. And when we have these narrow interfaces and we kind of like append them to one another, we're going to get a wider interface. So this is how we are able to get more data across the bus. And like, uh, like how we, we saw above where, where the banks are sharing the same um, address and data buses and command buses, the ranks are as well. They're going to all respond to the same command. Um, they're providing the um, uh, they're, they're sharing the command, but the distinction between our uh, chip, uh, the, kind of the bank chip relationship and the chip um, rank relationship is now they're providing different data. Okay. Going up one more layer. So this is the next layer up from our rank. We have DRAM modules, which consists of one or more ranks. Uh, for example, the, the most common kind of module are these DIM modules, these dual inline memory modules. We're on like version four or something. And this is what you put into your motherboard. Um, So let's just say that we have chips with 8-bit interfaces. Okay, so there's 8 bits coming out of each chip. This probably means that there's 8 banks per chip. We're getting one bit from, from each of the different banks on each axis. If we want to read 8 bytes in a single axis, we would need to have 8 chips on our DIMM. Um, each one would basically be giving us one, one byte. So that's just an example of, of how this hierarchy is allowing us to kind of uh, um, create a larger interface from these, these smaller pieces. Okay, so th this hierarchy is allowing us to um, 
not have to have this massive array in our memory that is really slow and takes a lot of power just to keep on, for example. All right, so we've gone all the way up to our module. Um, and here's a kind of picture of, of what that might look like. We have a bunch of chips on our um, on our uh, module. And in this case, we only have one ray. So we're not really, you know, these would all be organized into a single rank, but um, now we're, we're uh, kind of ignoring the other, for example, a lot of times you, ha you would have another rank on the other side of the chip. Let's just pretend that that's not there for this one. Um, and then we have our data coming out here and we have our command ports over here that dictate what we're trying to get out of our uh, memory. All right, questions so far? Yes. Uh, I think that, so DDR I think is a, um, a, a specific technology for, for, for this. I'll, you know, I'll, I'll double check. Um, okay, so a lot of times what we'll then have on top of a, uh, um, like instead, instead of just one dim, we're going to have multiple. So now we have two modules, um, or in this case, four actually. Um, these two are kind of together and, to, and grouped logically together as, as, as one likely. And then this one's also grouped together as, as kind of one unit. Um, And obviously, if you have more bins, you're going to be able to store more data. That's good. What's bad is that there's complexity in figuring out A, where to put stuff. B, there's a bunch of interconnection issues that we're going to have to deal with. Energy consumption, there's all sorts of problems. But a lot of times, what we really care about is a higher capacity thing. Okay, uh, don't worry too much about you know the various lines here. Uh, this, these are may, what I'm kind of trying to get at here is this um, high level overview, and we'll dive down into more details as we go. Up another layer are channels. So oftentimes, what you'll see is that a CPU has two or um, maybe even more in some cases, channels, uh, which go out to different sets of DIMMs. In this case, we only have, what well, looks like we only have one DIMM per channel. That's totally reasonable. Oh dear, let me do this. And this kind of gives you a, a sort of overview here of, of all of the stuff that we've talked about. It's omitting some stuff. We have our channel. Uh, and th in this case, we have two channels. So these are independent of one another. And then each channel contains one or more DIMs. Each DIM is going to contain one or more ranks. In this case, it looks like we don't have, we only have one rank. So, so just a single one in this case. Each rank contains a bunch of chips. In this case, we have eight. And then each chip contains a bunch of different banks. 
And lastly, at the very bottom, we have our banks, which contain rows and columns. Okay. The key with channels is that, like I said, they're independent. Um, they have entirely different memory control systems. So there's two different memory controllers operating entirely independent of one another. Okay. Um, here's another picture that's kind of demonstrating the same idea. We have our two memory controllers with two channels. The channels go out to some number of, of, of DIMMs. Maybe they're organized into, um, maybe these two are on the same, same one, for example. Doesn't really matter. But each, each DIMM will contain one or more ranks. As you can see, this is this outer box here. And then each rank is going to contain our, our chip, our DRAM chip. And each, each inside of here, we will then have a bunch of banks. So these are all these little red things here. And inside of our bank, we have our rows and columns. All right. Another picture. Hopefully, one of these pictures hit home for you, and then um, uh, we'll we'll look at we'll also look from the top down, a, a different direction. So again, two different memory controllers going out on a different channel. In this case, looks like we do have um, uh, kind of some logical connection, maybe physical. These are these are two ranks on the same on the same. Um, on two sides of our module. And our ranks, we, we, we don't have any chips pictured here, but they would contain a bunch of chips that have a bunch of banks. One thing that this shows that the other ones didn't really show as well is the, the direction of, of information. So our command and our address all of that is going towards our, our modules, our, uh, away from the processor. And the data can go either way, right? We wanna be able to write and read from memory. If we could only read or if we could only write, that'd be pretty lame. Okay. Any questions on this bottom up view so far? Okay. Let's look at this from the top down now. We're going to see a lot of the same things, but maybe a different, a slightly different perspective on it. Again, if you haven't copied it, you can probably do this so you can keep track of where we're going. So another view. Here we have our, our processor. Now it's an Intel Core i7, which makes it faster and better, I'm sure. Um, that was sarcastic. AMD for the win. Memory accesses go off out across two different memory channels in the system. And we have our, our channel, which is a logical um association between two different dims so we have four different dims in the in the system but uh these two are on this channel these two are on the other one and then an individual ram stick is you know kind of the colloquial term for it is is our is our dim 
Now, as I mentioned, a lot of times you have uh, two different sides of your gem. So we have a, a front and a back that both contain an array of chips corresponding to different ranks. So we have on the front, we're going to have eight chips composing our rank zero. On the back, we have rank one, which is also another eight chips. Okay, so this is, uh, um, this is very, very common. When we look at a rank, um, one thing that we have to do is we have to select which of the ranks um, to go to. So in our in our memory module, most most of the time we'll use the you know the, the most significant bit, the first bit, to select which which rank we'll be in, whether it's the front or the back. That will determine which one we get here and then we we, we pull out the uh the data um uh from from the corresponding rank um okay so let's dive down again into a, a given rank so our 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 rank which gives us this 64 bits wide interface is consistent consists of in this case eight different chips hmm. not sure what this p is doing down here but we'll go with it anyway chip zero is going to give us the first eight bits chip one gives us the next eight bits etc all the way down to chip seven or chip, the, the eighth chip, which gives us the last eight bits of our wide 64-bit interface. Okay, so we're, we're kind of, um, you know, as you can see, this this line here, that's actually coming from a bunch of different chips forming this this larger interface. Now let's break down a chip. A chip gives us this 8-bit interface coming out of it, um, but we're getting that from a wide number of different things. Okay, so we're so we're we're getting the various. Um, we have to figure out which bank it's um, uh, the the data is in, and then we we will select out of that. When we look at a bank, now we we're seeing that this is again all the way bound down to our rows and columns. We have a row buffer which we pull out of, and then we we can um, potentially pull some number of uh, of bits out of our row buffer and send that across our bus. Okay, so that's our top down view. Like I said, that was going to be a lot quicker. So we, we've gone bottom up and top down now. Any questions? So we, we, we understand the organization of these things. Let's understand how to actually operate one. Um, so say that we want a cache block. We want this 64 bytes um, from our physical memory space, and we want to pull it into our cache. First thing we have to do is figure out which 
stem and which rank it's mapped to. So um, in this case, we're going to be really nice to ourselves and map it to stem zero at, and rank zero. Then we have to go and find uh, across our different chips the various data that we need. Um, so we have, again, we have seven, uh, eight, eight bits coming from each one of our chips on our rank. And we're gonna we're going to get first the the, the first um, eight bits from all of all of our chips. Um, this will all coalesce together and give us. Um, oh, sorry, each one one byte. Excuse me, and then uh, give us our. Um, Eight byte interface across, and we'll, we'll pull in eight bytes first. And then we will go to the next row and column, pull in the uh, next eight bytes. And we'll continue doing this until we've gotten all the data that we need. So, this isn't really to scale because. This looks like it's a third, two thirds already full, but really it's only um, two eighths full. To transfer this entire block, we're going to take eight IO cycles. IO cycles are not necessarily the same as our clock cycles. In fact, they're almost guaranteed to not be. Um, they're much slower. And we, we, we read these eight different columns, you know, again, this isn't really to scale. There should be more columns here, but we're reading each of these eight columns sequentially. What does that give us? Well, one thing that it gives us is row buffer hits, which is nice. Yay. So you're saying that the 64 byte block, uh, byte block of data will be distributed among the eight chips. Yes. Which is again why I was saying like it's very very difficult to say where any given address, like any given bit, would be stored. You'd have to know a lot about the mapping that goes on. Um, you know, it could be your data could be distributed on it. You know, even if, even just a small array or a small integer, for example, could be distributed across a few different chips. Um, maybe across different banks, depending on, depending on how this mapping goes. So, why do we need this again? Why can't we just have a big array? Well, a big factor is that we're we're able to kind of interleave our accesses together. We can instead of doing them sequentially with without uh, uh, um, when we're accessing different DRAM rows, we would have to do that. Uh, not in parallel if, if we had a single array of a bunch of just a, a massive array of DRAM rows. Um, so we'd have to wait after every single access. So we'd, uh, you can kind of see already this, this is not very good utilization of the, of the buses. If we can overlap, overlap and have the accesses going to different banks and uh, different ranks, maybe even across different channels, then we can kind of hide this latency of memory accesses. And hiding latency is kind of the name of the game in computer architecture. So this is, um, you know, one thing for this, we would, this is the ideal case. We could have in ideal cases where we have bank conflicts and, and such that, that cause us to have to 
to stall effectively on our bus. But um, under normal operation without conflict, we're going to be able to uh, overlap our axes, hide the latency, make it look like everything's happening nearly instantaneously, and call it a day. Well, not quite. There's a lot more to this than just this. Um, all right. Uh, I'm not sure why that was there. That's going, uh, let's, let's see what time is it. Yeah, I think we'll, we'll start a little bit on DRAM scheduling. Um, I guess before I do any final questions on the DRAM bank operations. All right, so scheduling. We have this row buffer. Um, it kind of acts as a cache for our DRAM. It, it, it caches a, a row, uh, a, a, and that's nice. We don't have to activate the row if we continue to access it. But uh, we could close it after every access. So this is the difference between two different uh, row buffer management policies. We can either have open row or closed row. Open row, we keep the row open after the access. This is what we've seen already where we leave the data in the row buffer. The obvious pro to this is that if we access that same row, we're going to get a row hit. And the row hit will not incur the penalty of having to pull that data uh, from our row in the in the bank down to the row buffer. We only have to access it because it's just right there. The con is that we could have conflict. If you ever have a cache, you're going to be able to have conflict. And if you have a conflict, you're going to incur a penalty. And the penalty involves moving that data from the row buffer back into your bank and then pulling the correct row down into the, your row buffer and then reading. So that's going to take a bit of time. On the other hand, we could have a closed row policy. And this involves closing the row after we access. And the pros are the converse of open row. Um, if we need to read a different row, that's great. We don't have a row conflict because there's no row there anymore. The con is obviously that if we do need to access the same row, then we're going to have to do an extra activation. We're going to have to pull that row that we just pulled in to the row buffer. We're going to have to do that again. We'll do this next time, um, but we'll kind of see. You know there are trade-offs to both of these. Um, if you if you kind of want if you're ambitious and want to do this on your on your own, uh, I've basically provided a number of nanoseconds that it'll it'll take for each one of these different situations, and then time of arrival in nanoseconds uh, for a bunch of different axes. Assume that x is a is one row and then y is a different row and then x plus one is just a different location on it on that row what we'll see though is that you know this is kind of going back and forth between x and y a lot which may not be ideal right maybe we want to just do all of the x's at once so that we get a bunch of row hits and then do the y what we're going to see, and this is a preview of next week, uh, is that that causes problems, especially in multi-core systems. If we start doing scheduling like that, we could, for example, just flood the system with a bunch of requests that happen to be on the same um, row in our bank. And then we just get uber priority. And it's great for us and terrible for everyone else. So we're going to have to look and see how we can improve fairness. 
Um, so that's a preview of where we are going. Uh, any last minute questions before you are dismissed? Okay, have a great rest of your day.